All right, guys, Peyton and I are hopping into an ad real quick. And I think it's safe to say that things have been pretty crazy with inflation and the economy. Gas prices. Gas prices. Holy crap, gas prices. I know. I went into, you know, tell them at the pump, oh, I need this much. And then it was double what I told them to put in. And I had no <laughs> I idea. I know. We just did that today. Yeah, literally today. Literally today. And then you add on top of that, I mean, all of us have bills and some of us even have debt. So how many of you wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt? Well, PDS Debt has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. We actually just finished paying Peyton's student loans off. It took a bit, but we did it. We buckled down and we did it. And sometimes you'll notice that when you're paying your debt off, it never seems to go away because you're just paying them interest, right? right? And so PDS debt can actually help with that. And it's actually really cool because they're offering to give our qualified listeners a free debt savings analysis just for completing the 30 second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash husband. All you have to do is this 30 second debt assessment and you get a free debt savings analysis from PDS debt, which is pretty cool. So you can at least see if it's something that would work for you and something that mm -hmm. you're interested in doing. In fact, we actually have another family member who's going to be going to medical school soon. Mm -hmm. and we all know how crazy medical school loans get. He will definitely be needing to use PDS debt. Again, it's for those that are making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down. PDS debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies, and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit accepted. You can literally save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash husband. That's P-D-S-D-E-B-T dot com slash husband. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash husband. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. Well, I think as this comes out, our live is officially over. But I know, I know it hasn't happened yet, but I know it was a blast. Thank you so much for those who came and attended and watched and hopefully enjoyed it. We don't really have too many announcements other than that. So I think we're going to kind of hop right into things and we'll save any other announcements for next week. All right. Okay. So what's your 10 seconds? So if you were on the live, you've probably already heard an in-depth story about it, but I'm trying to figure out the easiest way to explain this. So basically, well, a firework hit me. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It. Hold on. So Garrett is not the storyteller of the family. So a couple of weeks ago, no, a week ago mm -hmm. from when this comes out, we were at a friend's house and we were doing fireworks. I know all the firefighters right now are pissed off at me, um, but that's okay. Basically, we were sitting on the lawn, um, we were doing fireworks, and it wasn't like a huge firework. It was just, I don't know, a normal size fireworks, you know, one of those box fireworks that you light up. And so it lit up, and Peyton, me, and another friend were on the lawn on a blanket in the front, and the firework was going off normal, and then all of a sudden, in one shot to the side a little bit, and I was like, huh, that's weird. And then next thing you know, there's just fireworks coming straight at us. We have a video. Um, you can't see it very well. It's like a ring doorbell video, but we have a video and fireworks were coming straight at us. I being the hero that I am, <laughs> I jumped on top of Peyton and instead of her getting hit, I got hit right in my back and then right in my arm. You can't really see this anymore. Um, oh, I, you can see it. You can kind of see it on my arm, but we'll show some pictures on Instagram and YouTube and everything of my back, but I got hit with the firework. My shirt is the craziest part. So basically... I got, we got hit or I got hit and it, everything, everyone was running around. It was pandemonium. Everyone's freaking out. And I was like, oh, my back. And then Peyton's behind me and she goes, Garrett, take your shirt off right now. And I was like, what? She's like, take your shirt off. I took my shirt off and obviously I got hit. But the back of my sweatshirt looked like it had exploded. It looked like Garrett's whole back was melted Yeah, my from, his, from the back of his shirt. The entire back of my sweatshirt was Black, black, like completely black, like someone took gunpowder and just threw it on yeah. my back. So when he did take his shirt off, I was like, oh, it's not that bad. It was still bad, but I was just expecting it to be so much Yeah, worse. like I, after looking at my shirt, I expected my entire back to be just third degree burns. Yeah. But luckily, if that wasn't it, um, I don't know how. I really don't know how because it exploded on my back. If you mm -hmm. see my shirt, the shirt that we're going to share, 
You'll know. Um, yeah. You'll know what we're talking about. Woo! So that was my 10 seconds. It was, I don't know, it was pretty crazy. I'd never been, I mean, I think kids, people don't do this. I'm not advising this, but I think everyone's probably at some point shot like, you know, Roman candles at each other. <laughs> if not, then just ignore that I'm saying this. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. We talk about fight or flight or freeze because I actually think freeze should be added in there. It, yeah. But we talk about fight or flight or freeze and <laughs> Peyton was a freeze. I, I always am a freeze. Mm -hmm. I always am a freeze. Like in the moment, it took me probably three solid seconds to even realize we were getting hit with fireworks. Granted, Garrett did punch me in the face when he rolled on top of me. <laughs> I saved so you though. I think I was a little like my whole lip was numb I and also just the adrenaline, right? But so I, it took me a solid second to go, oh, there's fireworks being shot right at Garrett right this second. Yeah, it was just un unlucky. The box got tipped over and I think I'm a fight, but I'm not going to go fight the fireworks. So yeah, I would say I was a flight in that situation, which was the only correct thing to do. Right. In my opinion. Well, we did roll. Yeah, we rolled. We rolled a couple I learned of times. Enough. Yeah. I learned enough. Peyton and I were like rolling on the ground. just Yeah, trying to get away. Um, But yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. I'm good. Everything's healthy. He's alive. It could have been worse. No, really, though. It could have been worse. Like we were thinking about it and... No one else got hurt except really Garrett. <laughs> That's how it goes, you know. <laughs> no, there was like 30 people there too. Yeah. So no one else really got hurt. It could have gotten hit in the face or, you know, it could have been way worse, but that was fine. Just hit me in the back. And luckily my shirt was pretty thick. Mm -hmm. So before we hop into it, funny enough, I was wearing a murder with my husband t-shirt. And then I went back to the car. A sample shirt. Like a, yeah, like a uh, new design a new that merch. Coming, yeah, yeah new merch shirt that we have coming out i went back to the car i for some reason said ah, i'm just gonna change shirts and this had, was before yes yeah, so this was before the fireworks i'm gonna change shirts um it was getting like a little colder so it was like a thicker shirt and i'm glad i changed shirts because i'm pretty sure if i was wearing that other shirt it would have melted right through i would have been because it's like a lightweight tee yeah the other one like a summer tee and this you, one was more thick it was like a winter t-shirt yeah. is the best way to explain it that was my story. Um, sorry if I told it super fast. I was getting all excited trying to tell it. I was like, I'm going to tell this on my 10 seconds. Yeah, that's the first thing he said. Well, at least now I have something for my 10 seconds. Yeah, I felt like it was a pretty good one. Other than that, nothing too crazy. Um, I mean, I guess that was crazy. And I think we're just going to hop right into it. Yep. Our case sources are the Norway Post, NewsInEnglish.no, NordicWorld.tv, MapCarta.com, TrickFast.com, The Telegraph, NewsBreezer.com, IMDB.com, and Wikipedia. Okay, so our episode this week takes place in Norway in 1999, and it surrounds a family, the Orderud family. And I want to say, again, these are all Norwegian words, names, so I'm going to try my best. I've looked up every single word to try to figure out how to pronounce it, um, but there's always different answers. So if I do it differently, that's why. This story kind of dives into the complications of family relations, inheritance, revenge, and sibling rivalry. It all becomes enough motive for this family. So this case involves a number of people, and because it is a family, there are similar names and some strange ties. So I'm going to do my best to lay it out very clearly for us. So we have the Orderud family, which started with the father and mother, who are Christian and Marie Orderud. Christian Orderud was born in 1918 and after growing up he met Marie Orderud who was born in 1915 and they got married and this started their family. Together Christian and Marie became pregnant and on April 3rd 1952 they welcomed Anne Orderud into the world. So I've also seen that it could be Anne Anne instead of Anne but I'm just going to stick with Anne that's how it's spelt but just know it could be Anne. And Anne is their eldest and one and only daughter. Just two years later, again, the Orderuds deliver another child, this time a boy. And his name is Pierre. Um, again, it could be Pierre, but I'm pretty mm. sure it's just Pierre. Okay. And that would make Pierre two years younger than his sister, Anne. So this is the Orderud family. And that was the beginning of the family of four. Life was good. They're living in Norway. Father Christian um, ran a family farm for a living where the family also lived. The farm would later be known as the Orderud family farm. 
The farm is located about 50 kilometers or 80 miles from Oslo, Norway, and the farm had a main house, a secondary house, and a barn on it. The secondary house was a fairly good-sized home. It had a balcony um, on the second floor and was white all of the way around it. The back of the house went up to the edge of the woods. According to VG.no, the main residence and barn and the secondary residence were only 200 meters or 656 feet apart. Um, essentially just to lay it out clear for you, you have the main house and the barn right across the street from each other, very close together, 200 meters away, kind of up more on the hill lays the second residence. Okay. So Anne and Pierre Orderud were raised on the farm until adulthood. And by all accounts, this farm was just their way of life. Like they grew up there. They both worked on the farm. It was just what their family did. But Pierre and Anne saw different futures for themselves. Although Anne was the eldest and loved the farm, she didn't see it as her future. She wanted more. She wanted to leave and discover herself and make a life of her own. So Anne would eventually leave and meet and marry a man named Pierre Paust. Okay, so Pierre Paust, her husband, is different than Pierre Orderud, her brother, but both named Pierre. She just happened to fall in love and marry a man with the same name as her brother. So don't get confused between the two. So Anne and Pierre Paust, her husband, husband, lived in Oslo, the capital of Norway. They were a successful, vibrant couple who both worked in service for their country. She worked at Norway's Ministry of Defense, where she was the personal secretary for the Norwegian defense minister. So very high up. Oh. And Pierre, her husband, worked at the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a prominent high-level diplomat. Mm-hmm. So while Anne had achieved her dreams, her brother Pierre Orderud's lifelong dream was to eventually take over the family farm. He had no desire to leave like Anne did. He had worked on it since he was little and had made it known to his parents, Christian and Marie, um, that this was his plan all along. And he was right on his way to do so. Christian Orderud, his father, retired um, when Pierre Orderud, his son, turned 30. So this was in 1984. Pierre had already been working on the farm with his father, but now that his father was retired, he would be given more responsibility. Christian would still own the family farm, but again, the plan was one day for Pierre to buy it from him. Mm -hmm. When Christian retired, he and Marie, his wife, decided to move from the main house that was right next to the barn to the secondary home, the white one that was up kind of more on the hill. And this allowed Pierre, their son, to move into the main house on his own and run the farm from there because it's right across from the barn. It's more, it's next to everything that he would need. About 10 years later, when Pierre Orderud was 40, he met and married a woman named Veronica, who was only 21. Now, Veronica was born in 1972, so she was about 18 years younger than Pierre. Okay. But anyways, they get married, and Pierre and Veronica are living on the Orderud family farm in the main house, and his parents are living 200 meters away in the secondary residence. Anne is also married, like we said, and off living her own life. She's still in contact with her family. She still visits them all the time. Time. But it was around this time that strange things began happening to Anne and her husband, Pierre. According to Bella Fiore's YouTube video on this, which I watched and it was great, on March 3rd, 1997, at about 1.30 a.m., after an evening out with friends, Anne and Pierre, her husband, were assaulted by a random man on the sidewalk. Mm. The man threw Pierre down and started kicking him. Anne, who was present, tried to stop the assault, and the man began hitting her too. This strange man eventually stops and walks away, leaving both Pierre and Anne injured but alive. Didn't steal anything? Didn't steal anything, just attacked them. Then on July 15th or 17th, the sources differ, Anne discovers a suspicious looking device taped to the underside of her car. One report says the car involved was her official Ministry of Defense car, so her work car. Anne needed to get to work though, so she drove to work with the strange looking tube still attached underneath her car. Oh, that's kind of sketchy. Yeah, she left the car parked outside the Ministry of Defense building in Oslo. She isn't sure what the object is, and so she eventually goes to the Oslo police about it later that day. The police determined that the object strapped to the underside of Anne's car is dynamite. It turns out to be more than half a kilo of explosives. Holy crap. Yeah, The police, of course, take this incident very seriously. So this would have been about a pound of dynamite underneath her car. Okay. Less than a month later, on August 12th, 1998, another unsuccessful assassination attempt occurs, this time at Pierre and Anne Pau's residence in Oslo. So it's for sure assassination attempts. Right. I mean, 
they've been beaten up. Then there was dynamite attached to her car. And now the couple who lived in an apartment in Oslo in the middle of the night, Pierre smells gas inside of the apartment. That's weird. He wakes up. He also hears some kind of hissing noise coming right outside the front door. So he opens the front door and finds that someone has left a five kilo tank of gas outside their door with the vent open. Um, the tubing from the tank was put inside or right next to a crack in the front of the building to allow the gas to leak inside of their apartment. Police also found a trail of gasoline that had been poured down the street leading to the house front door. This obviously oh could have caused a major explosion, but apparently no one had actually lit the whole contraption on fire. So in order for this to actually explode, there needed to be fire, but no one had lit it yet. So right now I could be wrong, but it seems obviously it seems like assassination attempts, but like more like they're trying to scare them than, than actually, than kill, actually them. kill them. They beat them up. He didn't beat them to death. Right. The dynamite I didn't mean, explode. Nothing exploded. And right now, I mean, luckily, obviously nothing happened. No one's so lit far. it yet. Correct. But it does really feel like someone is trying to kill or at least scare. But I mean, it's still deadly what they're doing. Yeah. And it's happening to Anne and Pierre Pouse. And I mean, they do work for the government. Remember, they're mm -hmm. high up in defense. So the police are taking it very seriously. They're like, this could be an attack on our country for all we know. So although there's a lot of publicity around these events, no one is arrested in connection with any of the assassination attempts. But given these attempts, Pierre and Anne are taken to a secure location to some sort of safe house at a military camp, presumably by the Norwegian government. On September 3rd, 1998, Pierre and Anne, afraid of their lives, decide to take the opportunity to go to New York to get away from the danger they're facing at home. So they stay in New York for four months, during which Pierre Paus serves as a consul general in New York. In January of 1999, Pierre and Anne decide to return home to Oslo after their time in New York. I mean, you can't just keep hiding forever. Mm -hmm. Apparently, um, they come home. They feel like things have been safe. It's been four months. And so they decide that they no longer need police protection. Hopefully, uh, whatever was going on is done now that they've left and come back. But despite their near misses with death, it doesn't stop knocking on their door. On May 6, 1999, Pierre Paust dies after a very short-lived illness. He'd very recently been diagnosed with cancer and wow. it took his life. Okay. There is some speculation that maybe his death was somehow still done by someone else who wanted him dead, that maybe he was exposed to some sort of toxin or poison that gave him cancer and caused his death, but that's never been proven. Like no sources have ever proved it. No one has ever gotten in trouble for it. By May 15th, 1999, just nine days after Pierre's death, a man calls 180, which is apparently Norway's version of 911 and makes threats saying that Anne Paust and her parents are going to be murdered. So okay. just nine days after her husband dies from cancer, someone calls the police and says, we're going to kill Anne and her parents now. But nothing about the brother. Nothing about the brother. All right. So suspicions are already coming along. Right. So the 180 operator alerts law enforcement to the threatening call. The police try, but are unable to figure out who's made the calls. But I do want to note here that the call, this call is confusing because I've seen two different versions of what happens. So, or perhaps these are two completely separate incidences. Remember that a lot of the sources were just translated. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to list both. Either way, they still come to the same conclusion. Here's uh, one of the versions. A woman who was a phone operator called the police and said that on May 17th, she received a phone call asking for Pierre and Anne Orderit's address and their phone number. The operator gave the information out and then the caller said that Anne had done terrible things and calls Anne curse names. The caller then says he's going to kill Anne. So either someone called the cops or someone called this operator. Either way, the police are informed about the call. It's investigated. No one knows who made it. I think it's weird that somebody would call and say... I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. It does still, though, seem in line with the fact that what, that what you were saying about the attempts not actually ever going through. Scaring them. Again, this feels like a scare. Like, why do you have to warn? Why don't you just go do it? So I feel like there has to be something more going on. Right. From Anne's perspective, maybe. Mm -hmm. Something just seems off. Like, is there something she's hiding? Is there something someone's hiding something? Could be wrong. Right. But that's kind of where I'm at. So I think not with Anne, just because... 
I mean, she obviously got scared enough that her and her husband went to New York for four months, like up mm. and left their life That's true. and went to New York. So I think when we're telling this in such a quick form, it seems like, oh, well, if someone tried to take my life three times, I, you know, yeah, but yeah. they did leave. They did go for four months. They came back. They hoped everything was fine. And then her husband dies. Yeah, it's true. Okay. So either way, five days later, police are really going to wish they had known who made that phone call. The night of Saturday, May 22nd, 1999, a grieving and upset Ann Orderud is at the Orderud family farm visiting her parents for the weekend as her husband has just died of cancer. She's grieving. She wants yeah. to be with family. She doesn't want to be alone. She drives her car there and leaves it parked outside of the secondary house where she's staying with her parents. She stays in a bedroom in the basement for the night. On the morning of May 23rd, 1999, Christian's brother, Hans, who is Anne's uncle, so the father's brother, goes to the farm to visit family. No one answers the front door of his brother's house, which is the secondary house. Hans walks up the hill, goes around to the back of the house, and it's there that he sees the first warning sign that things are maybe not okay at the Oderode family farm. He sees broken glass in the back French door. So this broken glass is for a door on the second floor terrace or a balcony of the home. Mm -hmm. Remember that this house goes up onto a hill. So technically someone could just walk onto the second floor balcony. So it's kind of more like a deck, except it is on the second floor of the house. It's just that the house is on a hill. So from the front, there's two floors and you enter down on the first floor, but from the back, the first floor is underground, like a basement type. Okay. And the second floor is level now with the ground. Go so ahead. the uncle hands then goes into the house to investigate after noticing that this door has broken glass. He discovers three dead bodies, the okay. bodies of his loved ones, all shot at close range. 81 year old Christian ordered the dad. Oh, he was 81 by this point. Yeah. Because I mean, he retired yeah, and yeah. now his son has taken over 84 year old Mary ordered wow. the mom and their daughter, 47 year old Anne ordered. So like I said a couple of minutes ago, something's where's the brother, right? Something's off. All three bodies are found upstairs. Anne was lying in her nightgown on the kitchen floor. Marie was on the floor in the living room, also in her nightgown, and Christian was shot while still in bed. Hans calls the police, who arrive on the scene and begin investigating the triple murder. It's immediately clear to police that the murderer went in through the smashed back door. Police determined that Christian and Marie had been sleeping in the primary bedroom, which was on the second floor. According to Bella Fiore's video, Christian was shot twice, first with a 38 and then with a 22. This Weird. made police suspicious now that there was more than one intruder yeah. because why are there two different guns used during the attack christian may have tried to get a shotgun he kept in the primary bedroom closet to defend them but he was killed before he was able to do so marie was shot in the chest with the 38 she oh. tried to run away out of the bedroom she made it to the living room but was then shot again again with the 38 it took hours for marie to die from blood loss oh, due to the man. gunshot wounds Anne was staying on the lower level, like we said, or the basement of the house. She must have run upstairs when she heard the terrible shots coming from above. Anne was found upstairs lying on the floor in the kitchen by the kitchen door, which led to the outside. So maybe she was trying to get out of the house. She too was shot by a 38. The police found multiple spent shell casings in the house from two different guns. They also found that the killer, or at least one of them, had left a partial shoe print on the broken glass of the door. Clearly, the killer had kicked in the door. According to newsbreezer.com, Christian was shot two times, Marie was shot four times, and Anne was shot a total of six times. Jeez. In the woods outside of the house, the police find a yellow or orange woolly hand-knit sock. The police's theory is that the murderer or murderers wore socks over their shoes in order to avoid leaving shoe prints at the scene. The police believe that the sock they found could have been coming off the murderer's foot before the murderer went inside, given that the partial shoe print was found on the glass. But I personally think it seems more likely that the sock fell off afterward as the murderer was fleeing the scene. And that's where the shoe print comes from. Mm -hmm. All right. Where's the brother? <laughs> You're over it. Let's get to it. Where's well, the brother? I mean, I know there's more to it, so we'll keep going. But I'm curious when they bring the brother in to this situation. Well, from almost the beginning of the investigation, the police believe that the victims knew their murderer or murderers. Okay. Nothing was known to have been taken from the house, which ruled out robbery as the motive. Also, it's like this house is on a farm on a lot of acreage. Why them? So 
Given the previous assassination attempts, police also believe that Anne was probably the intended target. Okay. Because before this, the parents were never involved. Makes but sense. now that she's at the home, her parents are murdered. Police further believe that only someone who knew the family would have known that Anne was visiting her parents that yeah, weekend. That's true. Given all of this, the first person police interview is the only remaining member of the Order Road family who also happened to be sleeping only 200 meters away the night of the murders because he was living in the main house. Mm -hmm. This is Pierre and his wife, Veronica, who live in the main house on the same property, and they are questioned. However, Pierre and Veronica claim to have heard nothing. They say they didn't realize anything had happened until the police arrived to question them that morning. I would imagine the police perhaps think it's odd that Pierre and Veronica hadn't heard the 12 or more gunshots that happened in the middle of the night. It's also possible that not all of the shots fired actually struck the victim. So I'm thinking there could have been more than 12 shots fired mm -hmm. because the number of shell casings they found was more than 12. Got it. For a variety of reasons, Pierre and Veronica became suspects early on. I mean, it was the first person you yep. suspected as well. They claim they were home sleeping when the murders took place. However, according to Bella Fiore's YouTube video, apparently a neighbor who rented property on the farm told police that their cars were gone that night and so were the dogs. Mm, okay. So I'm not sure if this makes sense or if it's even helpful in the investigation. Either way, it just seems like they've lied to police. But this leaves the question, why? Why would Pierre be so desperate to kill not only his sister, but his parents as well? And what does that make for the earlier attempts on just Anne's life? Like why, if he just wanted to kill Anne, why would he then drag his parents into it later? As the police dig into a motive, they discover details about the Order of Family life, which made it seem like maybe it wasn't just a happy-go-lucky farm and family after all. Okay. Maybe there was a lot more than meets the surface. Police learn Anne had never wanted to stay around working on the farm, like I said, and instead pursued her life and government career in Oslo. Unlike his sister, though, Pierre's life seemed to revolve around the family farm. He was the one who began working full time at the farm and ultimately took over running the farm. The deal between Pierre and his parents, apparently, was that Pierre Orderud um, would buy the farm from his parents someday. That was what they'd promised. Once they retired, he would take over all responsibility. And then, like, you know, once it was close to death time, he would buy the farm from them. Which... It's super interesting, actually, that you mentioned that just because... It wasn't inherited? Yeah, that, I guess. But buying the farm from someone who's... Let's say they live until they're 90 and they he buys a farm for them at 88 years old. Like, what are they really going to go do with a, a, a lot of extra money at right. 88 years old? They're not going to go sky... You know what I'm They're not yes. going to go probably do these crazy adventurous traveling. Exactly. They could, but that just seems, seems interesting. So I... What I was, I asked the same question, but then as I dug further, I think the purpose behind making him buy it, even at such a late age, just versus a learning purpose, was a learning purpose. Okay, that, like that it makes seems like it was important to Christian, the father, um, that Pierre work for his life, that it wasn't just handed to him, that both of the kids work for life, that it wasn't just Got handed it. to him. This seemed he had noted that this was important for him as a father to teach his children. Okay. So the police later learn that at some point, Christian came across some tax returns after he had retired and these tax returns were from the farm that he still owned by the way he was still owner uh pierre yeah. his son was just running it and he discovered that pierre had falsely put himself down as the owner of the farm on the tax returns mm. um, according to the youtube video this bothered him this bothered him this his son had lied this wasn't true he was jumping the gun on the process that christian had so uh like perfectly set out christian then hired a lawyer and increased the price that pierre and him had had agreed upon that pierre would someday have to pay for the family farm so he okay. said if you're gonna if you're gonna go behind my back and you're gonna lie about the farm that i've entrusted you to run we are now going to raise the price that you have to work for to pay for this farm. Another reason for Christian to increase the price of the farm, aside from being upset with Pierre, was to make sure that Anne 
would get her fair share of the inheritance and to ensure that the parents wouldn't literally just give the farm away. Because based on Pierre's actions, Christian felt like Pierre might eventually screw over his sister as well. And so he's trying to cover the family bases. Based on this move, he felt like Pierre was trying to take all the money. And he was like, no, I need to make sure that she gets some as well. So he's trying to keep it fair and everything. I'm sure Pierre's upset. I don't know if it's him yet. I assume it is, but we'll see. But I'm sure he's upset because he's thinking, well, I worked on the farm my entire life and she never did. Yes. Interesting. So police also discover this. Because Anne was the older sister, she was the first in line to inherit the farm Uh, if something were to happen to her and Pierre's parents. Okay. So despite the fact that they had said, Pierre, you can buy the farm, the only way he was going to get the farm is if he bought it. Because if they died before he bought the farm, she was to inherit it. Okay. So apparently Christian was also upset with Pierre because the farm wasn't doing well. He'd kind of run it into the ground a bit. And Pierre had taken out a loan on the farm and this could jeopardize the farm's financial future. Again, screwing over not just him, but his sister as well. So Christian and Pierre have a big fight over the financial ins and outs of the farm that, that, you know, he goes to him, he confronts him about the whole thing. Pierre's like, well, it's mine. I deserve it. And he's like, no, that that's not how this works. She's going to inherit the farm, all of this stuff. And so they actually stop talking to each other for a year because wow. of this. Okay. Even though they live 200 meters away from each other on the same farm, yeah. they don't talk that's for so a year. Awkward. So Pierre ended up suing his dad took his dad to court over the price of the farm. Um, He said, you know, we had this agreed upon amount, it's written and you're now trying to change it. And the court found that Christian had signed a contract and agreed on a price of the farm and now are saying you you can't just later increase the price. You signed paperwork saying this was the price. So Christian, however, appeals the decision because the court sides with Pierre. He appeals the decision saying, I've never signed any papers. It was just a talk. It was a verbal. I don't even know what these papers are that you're producing. I never signed any papers. No way. Did he forge them? So the case gets reversed because the court found that Pierre had forged his own father's signature on these papers. That's nuts. And I think this just further shows Christian that everything he was trying to teach his son was not working because Pierre was just doing whatever he could to, to get what he wanted. So police realize all of this fully gives Pierre motive to kill his family, not just Anne because she's the inheritance, but also his parents. So the police believe that Pierre wanted all of the inheritance to himself. Anne had been talking about if the parents died, she was going to just divide the farm into smaller pieces and sell the pieces off to developers because it was kind of already failing at this point. So she was like, the best would be for me to just divide it all and sell it. So Pierre wanted to keep the farm property intact and believed the farm rightfully belonged to him. His parents were elderly and not in good health. So if he couldn't buy it in time and stood in the way since she was the older sibling and was the first in line to inherit the farm. Which is so weird because if it's a failing farm, I mean, yeah, you should sell it and And, sell it to developers and try to make some money. Right. I don't think he's thinking that way, but also this makes more sense about why Anne was the intended target in the first place and not the parents. Because if he kills Anne, then he just has to wait for his parents to die and he gets the farm. But Pierre did not carry this out alone. Remember that we talked about how police think there was more than one person in the house. Good old Veronica. So police suspect that Pierre's wife, Veronica, may be involved and that she was in on it just for the money, just for money's sake. You know, if they didn't want to run it, if he got inherited it, maybe they could sell it and then they could make money from it. Apparently, an ex-boyfriend of hers says that she only dated him for money and points out that she's 18 years younger than Pierre and probably figured this whole time that he was going to get the farm, get the inheritance, While police are piecing all of this together, about 10 days after the murder, they were called to some woods where there were reports of gunshots. It turns out that there was a woman out there named Kristen Kerkimo taking target practice out in the woods. So it's just a random call. They go out, they find this woman, Kristen. And this is a big deal because Kristen is Veronica, Pierre's young wife's half 
sister. So okay. she's relate. She's tied into this murder that yep. just happened 10 days ago. So police are like, what the heck? So given her familial connection to the murdered family, her half sisters, in-laws, the police want to question her in the course of the interview. The police become suspicious of her as they're interviewing. They're like, okay, something's going on. Police get a search warrant to search the house that Kristen lives in with her boyfriend, Lars. Now Lars is 15 years older than Kristen. The police find evidence of criminal behavior during the search. They find drugs, a lot of them. They find guns. They find explosives. One of the guns police discover during the search of Kristen and Lars' home is a 22 caliber gun. Police test the 22, but determine it's not one of the murder weapons. Mm. However, the bullets in this 22 gun were exactly the same type of bullets that had been used by the 22 murder weapon. So it might not be the weapon, but it's the same type of bullets, which you might be like, okay, but that doesn't matter. But yeah, also if I they mean, have a lot of guns and they're using the same type of bullets, it could be a different gun and they just provided the bullets for the gun. Does that uh, make sense? So by bullets, you mean like manufacturer? Yes. Made, okay, yes. okay, okay. So it's difficult to be sure when the vast majority of sources are in Nor Norwegian, but I don't believe the actual murder weapons were ever found in this case. They never yeah. found the actual guns. It can also be a coincidence. I mean, a lot of people can have the same True. manufactured bullets True. and so forth. True. But I think just the uh, connection, you know, yes. these people, it's pretty clear that Lars and Kristen are not living the best lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got drugs, guns, explosives. They, they're kind of hanging out with a rougher crowd. There's something going on. Yes. So because of this, police also begin questioning Lars too. So there's now four suspects in this murder case. Kristen starts turning on Lars, her boyfriend, and she says that he owns a 38 gun that he calls small boy that's no longer around, which also like he named his gun small boy. Yeah. Uh, okay. Go off. Go off, <laughs> Lars. So she tells police that she and Lars provided guns to Pierre and Veronica and that they helped them plan the murders, but they didn't commit the actual murders. They just provided them the guns and planned. Lars admits, okay, yeah, we did provide Pierre and Veronica with guns, but he denies knowing anything about them using those guns for a murder well, plot. They ratted them out real fast, huh? Yes. There Real is fast. zero loyalty there. And not just them, there. they have ratted each other out as well. Like they've turned on each other. That's crazy that there wasn't any, like if they both denied it or something. Right. They just instantly were like, oh yeah, he did it. Oh yeah, they did yeah, it. Yeah, they did it. So Lars claims he was at home at the time of the murders. No one could substantiate this. According to Bella Fiore's video, Kristen didn't have an alibi, but she then said that she spent the night making deliveries of some kind with a friend. The GPS on her phone actually did substantiate this. At first, this male friend didn't back up Kristen's alibi, but then said it was true and that they were making deliveries together. So it's kind of just a bunch of like back and forth lies. Apparently, this man's girlfriend comes into police and is like, no, he's lying. She tears apart Kristen's alibi and says it wasn't true that her boyfriend just had Kristen's phone that night. Okay. So Kristen had given a random guy, well, someone she knew, but in the story, a random guy, her phone and said, can you carry this around for me tonight while you go make your drug Weird. deliveries? Yeah, yeah. So trying to make an alibi for herself, but the girlfriend comes forward and says, no, she wasn't with us. She just gave her gave us her phone. So during the investigation, police learned that Kristen had a son when she was younger, but since she was a drug user, she wasn't allowed to see him. The young boy, however, was allowed to have visits with Veronica. So he would be taken for visits to the Orderwood Farm. Got it. Kristen would see the baby at the farm, so she knew her way around there and had been there before. This gives a motive for Kristen, which, I mean, it's not like a really big motive, but maybe she wanted Pierre and Veronica to hang onto the farm so she could continue visiting her son there. It was a way for her to see him. Also, during his interview, Lars claims that Kristen asked him to get some guns, which he did, like we said. Kristen also says that she asked him to do this and says that she gave a bag of guns to Veronica, who looked them over and put the guns down on the table at the farm. According to Kristen, Veronica put the bag down too hard and one of the guns fired and that a bullet went through the bag, struck a table and also hit one of the pictures on the wall. Veronica denies any of this and denies that there were ever any guns at the house. The only reason I'm pu even putting this in is because when police go to Veronica and say, hey, these two came, said they provided you guns, she was like, no, no, no. So they went back to Kristen and Lars and said, do you have any evidence that you were there yeah. with guns? And they said, oh, one of them actually went off and shot a picture frame. They go back to the farm they find a picture frame okay. shot, a table dented. So then they go to Veronica and they say, hey, well, they said this happened. So how can you explain this gunshot in your farm if this wasn't the case? 
She then decides to change her story, Veronica does, and says that she was home wrapping presents at the dining room table when Kristen comes over and threatens to kill herself with a gun. According to Veronica, Kristen is waving around the gun. She points it at her own head, but then she suddenly points it and shoots it at Veronica. Veronica says the shot misses, and this is how the bullet hit the table and the picture on the wall. So funny, the point of investigations when everyone starts changing their stories. And it's just not even making any sense. Like, come on, get out of here. So at this time, also police are confronting Lars about his small boy gun. Like, where'd your small boy gun go? We know you had a 38. <laughs> small boy gun. Where's small boy? And he admits, oh, well, I don't have it anymore. I sold it, but I, um, I did use it for target practice. Police go in the woods and they're able to find where he used his small boy gun for target practice. Wow. And they find a bunch of spent shell casings from his 38 small boy. These shell casings match the shell casings that were found at the murder scene. Okay. So this, I mean, police have basically concluded that small boy was used as a murder weapon, but it was never found. So in June or July, 1999, there is a funeral session and church service for the three murdered victims. Pierre Orderud is present at his family's funeral and is seen weeping in grief. At some point in June or July, Pierre and Veronica Orderud are arrested and charged with the murders okay. of his parents and her in-laws. Kristen and Lars had already been arrested on illegal firearm charges, but now Kristen and Lars are also charged um, with complicity to commit murder. According to the Norway Post, the four defendants are released from custody after five months in prison. I'm guessing they were released on bond or, you know, uh, bail. Oh, okay. So that wasn't like their... No, they didn't serve time. They just, they get out and I'm guessing that's why. It's like they why. just got five months of prison. Right. On June 22nd, 2001, Pierre, Veronica, and Kristen were convicted on all charges, which include complicity to commit premeditated murder. Wow. They each receive a sentence of 21 years in prison, and they all appeal their sentences. Lars was found guilty of charges involving illegal weapons. He was sentenced to only two and a half years in prison for his involvement in the case. So by all accounts, the defendants are convicted of being accessories to the murder. However, none of them were charged or convicted of actually committing the murder. I mean, being the uh, one to pull the trigger. So there wasn't enough evidence for no. that. No. So the question has always remained, who actually did it? Who actually pulled the trigger? On April 5th, 2002, the prosecution prevails on its appeal of Lars's sentence and Lars is resentenced, now receiving a much harsher penalty. He is sentenced to 18 years in prison. Okay. After the appeals, Kristen is sentenced to 16 years in prison. So somehow she gets hers reworked. In 2011, Kristen is released from prison. In 2013, Lars is released from prison. Around January 7th, 2015, Pierre is released from prison after serving 14 years. Wow. He moves back to the Ordered Family no Farm, freaking, wow. which he has inherited because all of his family members are dead and he's been renting out the whole time he's in prison and making money off of it. For some reason, I don't know, I feel like that should be not illegal? allowed. Yes. Yeah. I feel like it should be illegal. Well, it's you the will. You can't kill your family, inherit something. Go to prison, serve time for prison, killing them, only, and then Only profit. 14 years, by the way, for killing three people. Right. And then go back to getting the farm. Well, if this was America, he probably wouldn't have gotten 14 years. I also feel like, I'm curious, Is I wonder if there's more rules behind it, inheriting it, like if it would have went to the state right? instead of, instead of staying with murderer. him. Instead of the murderer. Either way, Veronica is due to be released the following week, and once out, she also moves back to the Holy farm. crap. So Pierre and Veronica stay together and maintain their innocence. And as far as I know, they're still alive. And since then, they have hired private investigators to try to clear their name, even though they've served time. Wow. For the murder, serve their time. They have hired private investigators claiming, no, we never did it. This is who did it. Yeah. Um, in 2018, a witness ties Lars to the 180 call made back in 1999 that threatened the lives of the three. Um, it's not clear why the witness waited 20 years to come forward, but they do. Pierre and Veronica formally file to reopen the case, like I said, hiring a PI. And according to newsenglish.no, the PI has delivered more than 1,000 pages and 28 videos of material to the state commission charged with evaluating whether criminal investigations should be reopened. The PI claims that he's discovered new evidence that he believes clears Pierre and Veronica. The resumption committee is to decide in 2020 if the case should be reopened and re 
investigated. We're, we're past 2020. Right. I can't find whether that happened. Okay. I can't find if the request went through. I haven't seen any reports indicating that the convictions have been set aside. So I'm going to guess it didn't. I'm going to guess they said, mm. nope, we had the right people. We're not reopening the case. Lars passed in the fall of 2019. And I believe Kristen has since passed away wow. as well. But I mean, I, I can't be sure about that. So yeah. Pierre and Veronica are living on the Orderwood family farm. And that is the story of the Orderwood triple homicide. That's crazy. It's crazy because one, they're, I mean, they're out and they're just living life like nothing happened. Still on the farm. Two, I mean, I guess, I mean, they were convicted. So I guess I can say it's them. Right. Do, I, do I think they were involved somehow, no matter what? Yes. I just think there's too much evidence. The second Lars and Kristen yes. are found, they turn on them. There's the the bullet hole in the whether they pulled the trigger whether they hired them either way i don't care it doesn't, it's same, you're same. guilty yeah. same 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 yeah i agree i mean whether they were the ones that were there or not if they hired someone to do it, if they hired lars and Kristen, it's, it's the same crazy. thing that's it's so sad he just killed his family i personally think so messed up that his first plan was to kill just Anne and maybe her husband pierre and um just get the inheritance off his back mm -hmm. so that either way he gets the farm, whether he yeah. buys it or he inherits it, he gets the farm. But then uh, I think it just got to the point where he was like, I'm not, this is too hard. I've tried three times. She's not died yet. Or I didn't scare her off. I'm just going to kill all three. Also, I think it's so sad that her husband died. And I do wonder if it was a coincidence or, or if, if he actually Pierre died. Killed I, him. Either way, it's sad because it's awful. He died so young. Right. He does that was an interesting one. Yeah. I think that's why it was so heavily suggested. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've never heard of it. It's a Norway and case. And it's kind of just gone off into the dark and they're living there and I'm sure yeah. everyone in the town hates them. Oh, I'm sh I'm well, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe I could not. if you're from there, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but no, it's it's pretty crazy. That's nuts. Okay, you guys, that was our episode for this week. Again, thank you for everyone who attended the live. I'm sure it was a blast. And we will see you guys next week with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. <laughs>